Hello everybody and welcome to today's Business Connected Lunch and Learn webinar. My name is Amy, I am a Programme Manager at Enterprise Nation and very happy to welcome you here today. For those of you who are joining the Enterprise Nation Lunch and Learn for the first time, we are a vibrant community of small businesses and business advisors that exist to shortcut your route to trusted business support. So today's session is part of Business Connected. We've partnered with Vodafone Business to equip 800,000 small businesses over the next three years with different digital skills. The programme is also supported by our digital partners, JP Morgan, Sage and Build at AI. For more information, please do visit the Business Connected Hub. We'll be dropping the link in the chat today. But today I am pleased to introduce AI educator, Kerry Harrison. Kerry will share possible uses for text generation platforms, as well as AI image generation tools. So in this lunch and learn, you will discover about prompt writing and the wider ethical implications for using these new technologies. If you have any questions throughout today's session, please do post them in the Q&A function and we'll answer them at the end of Kerry's talk. It'd also be great if everyone could share a little bit in the, about themselves in the chat, where they're tuning in from today and a little introduction to your business as well. And also a reminder that today's webinar will be recorded and we will send a follow-up email to you later today with the recording and further resources. But welcome, Kerry. I will now leave you to take the online stage. Thank you very much, Amy. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here. Uh, so we've got a lot to get through today. So I've got about 35 minutes to cover AI image and text generation tools. So just a little bit of an intro to me. So I'm Kerry Harrison. I am an AI educator and a copywriter specializing in generative AI. So I've been a copywriter for the last 20 years. I started out in the world of advertising in 2001. I worked my, worked my way up through the ranks um, from mentoring junior writers to managing a creative department. And then in 2018, I set up a, co-founded a creative practice called Tiny Giant, which is all around exploring the capabilities of AI from a creative point of view. So my specialty is around AI and creativity and how it can support us in that area, how we can use AI to augment our amazing human skills. So just a quick highlight, I suppose, from the last five years for me in the world of AI. So I've obviously been working in AI since 2018. And I just thought I'd give you a quick highlight, a few highlights rather than me going on and on about myself. So five highlights from the past five years. So one of the projects that I did at Tiny Giant was to create an AI curator for the Cheltenham Science Festival. Um, every year, the Cheltenham Science Festival have a, a human curator, a team of human curators, and the coordinator asked us if we could create an AI one. So this was in 2019. And we created an AI curator for the Chatham Science Festival. So she came up with a range of talk titles, one of which was delivered at the festival itself. This is a picture of me at about 5.30 in the morning on BBC Radio. We took our AI curator onto the radio and gave her an AI generated voice so she could take part in the conversations. So that was a really brilliant and lovely project to work on. Uh, we also created the world's first AI gin. So we used AI to generate a range of gin recipes, essentially, and then took those to a gin distillery in Bristol um, called Psychopomp. And they then used their amazing uh, human crafting skills to turn the AI generated recipes into a gin. The gym was created, it was also had an AI generated name, which was Monka's Garkle. So we trained it on every gin name we could find, and it came up with its own with its own name. Uh, it won two taste awards, it went all over the world and it sold out very quickly. I have one on my desk uh, over there. So I bought one to drink and one to keep, and it, it's still there. One day I will crack it open. Um, also won two awards for best use of AI in 2019 and 2020. So those DMA awards, which if you're in the world of marketing, you'll know um, it was a pretty big deal for us as a startup to win those, uh, those awards. We were up against the likes of Twining's Tea and Time, The Times and Twitter, so pretty big stuff for us. Um, also wrote a Queen speech for Wired magazine, which was really fun. They asked me just for a bit of fun, like, could you write um, a Queen speech for us? This was in 2020 or maybe 2021. And uh, I, they said, what do you need? And I said, well, every Queen speech you could possibly get hold of, please, would be brilliant. And they came forward, gave me loads of uh, Queen, this Queen speech as a text format, which I used to train a neural network and then generated um, 
a kind of Queen's speech, uh, which I then um, edited my human uh, abilities, which uh, the article still, you can still go and read the article if you want, it's pretty bonkers. Um, and this was in the days before the world of chat GPT. So um, th it was actually really hard to create generated text back then. And now we've got this completely uh, amazing tool that we can use really, really easily. Um, I've also done a lot of speaking uh, on AI, both nationally and internationally. Uh, this is me in the picture of, at Facebook talking about um, AI and, and content creation. So that, that's what I do. And now I've, I can't try pri primarily on that. Now I'm just really, I, I just really love talking about AI, supporting people, educating people. So I run a range of workshops for businesses and individuals. And that's kind of what I do. I run a company called Unclouded. And yeah. That's it's just essentially helping people to learn more about AI because I think so it's some people talk about it. Um, a lot of people now need to understand it and how they can use it in their work. Bearing in mind that a lot of people are still not using AI. So the fact that you're here today, you're already pretty ahead of the curve. And the fact that you want to know more about these tools. So a lot of people are tinkering around, but this is um this is much more precise in getting what you need from it from your business for your business. Um, so my AI training, I when I mean, as I've said, my training, I've got a couple of workshops coming up in the next uh, month or so. So I've got one on mid journey, which is all about image generation, which we'll talk about today. One on chat GPT. I also do half day AI for business and full AI and ethics workshops as well. So key takeaways for today, we're going to look at AI writing tools. We're going to look at image generation tools and most importantly use cases because I think the thing is with these tools they all sound rather fantastic but when it comes down to it you actually want to be using it for things that are helpful for us in our businesses. Uh, prompt techniques because it all comes down to the prompts um, and also what you do with it afterwards. So I think a lot of people say oh well if you get the right prompt then that, that's kind of that's kind of it done but I think what you do with it afterwards is also pretty important so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then consideration. So every talk that I do, every workshop that I do, I always outline the considerations. I think it's very easy for us to get taken in by the magic and, and wow factor of AI, but actually the way we use it is really important, not only to safeguard our own businesses, but also to preserve creativity and to take care of the wider you know, societal implications of using these tools because they're, they're pretty big and can be used for good, and also for more nefarious purposes. So I'll talk a little bit about that too. So AI assisted writing. So um, I've already talked about the speed of change. So when I wrote the, the Queen's speech back in 2021 using AI, the output was pretty bonkers and uh, nonsensical. And um, and now we've got ChatGPT, which I remember doing talks back in 2018 and 2019 and people saying to me like, are you worried about your copywriting work? And I was like, not worried at all it's like it's just terrible uh and then gpt3 arrived and it was like okay so i wrote a blog on that and I thought okay this is a bit of a, a game changer and then last year uh in november last year chat gpt came out and it was like okay so it's getting it's getting a bit more serious i'm, I'm still not worried about my uh, my job but i do think it's a great tool that we can harness um, so in terms of the tools that are available, and if anyone came to my last talk, which was just specifically on writing, we've covered we covered these a little bit there as well. But there's two platforms which have completely changed the way we write with AI, uh, ChatGPT, which I'm sure most of you all know about, and then Bard, which is Google's version. So ChatGPT is OpenAI's version of a text generation tool. It's a large language model. And then Google followed probably quicker than it wanted to with, with Bard, which I think from from using it, I tend to use ChatGPT over Bard, but I'm still exploring it. So it's a newer it's a newer tool. We have to remember as well that these tools are really really new. This time last year, neither of these tools were out in the in the public domain, so they're really new. Everyone's learning, and we just have to keep uh, exploring and and trying things out for ourselves. Um, Bard, interestingly, you know, th these things are always developing as well. It's really hard to stay on top of all the developments in AI. It's literally like every week there's something new that's come out. Um, so Bard have now very recently in the last week or so have started returning images as well as text. So you can also put an image in and get, you can get images back out, which is quite interesting. And ChatGPT have now included a range of plugins which you can use on, um, on, the, on the paid version. So ChatGPT has a default version, which uses uh, GPT 3.5. And then there's also a paid version, which uses GPT 4. So GPT 4 
from my point of view, is a significant jump from the default version. So if you have got £20 a month to spare, I would say use GPT-4. It's just much more refined and it you'll I think you'll get a better output. So there's also more specific tools for writing like Jasper. So Jasper is an a specifically AI copywriting tool and there's quite a lot of these tools that are available. You'll find uh, once there's, there's copy.ai, there's quite a few of them. About a year ago, I sat down with all, I sat down with five different copywriting, AI copywriting tools and tried them out with the same brief. The one that I really liked was Jasper. I thought it was very comprehensive. And so I've, I've focused on Jasper and I've used, I've used that going forward. It's got around 50 templates that you can use. So you can do everything from social media posts to um, product descriptions for Amazon through to blog post outlines, email subject lines, um, questions. I mean, there's so many templates that is um, it's paid. So you need to you need to pay for it. You get a five day free trial if you want to try it out. But it's what's quite good about this. If you're looking for something very specific is Jasper, you can go in, you can choose a template and then it will tell you exactly what you need to put in. Whereas obviously ChatGPT is very open. So we've got a lot more choices around the prompts that we, we use, but it's worth checking out um, for Jasper. Uh, there's also uh, literally, I reckon this is probably like three weeks old, Google's Help Me Write, which is, they've recently introduced a writing tool into their actual um, Gmail and into Google Docs. So you might well see that starting to come out now. I think if you're in Google Workspace, it automatically is there. So when I go into my Google Docs now to write my copy, there's a little magic wand that you can go in and use it to help you um, support your writing. So it will gen generate text for you. You can also use it to elongate or shorten or um, adjust things. You highlight what you want to adjust and then you can press a few buttons and it will change your writing for you or make it more more precise or concise so that's a, another way that I suppose Google are, are moving in now and changing the, the space because there's not just Bard it's also now building it into its workspaces as well so what can we use this, these tools for this is the this is the important thing so chat GPT is is such an, and I'm using ChatGPT now as opposed to Bard, just because that's where most of my experience is. I've used it on pretty much every project I've done since since January, not live, but just on a separate screen to go. Okay, if I did this project and asked AI to help me, what would it what would it do? And it is obviously great for generating text, but you can also use it for a whole bunch of other things like research. So it's really great for things like defining terms. If you're researching for a blog or you're researching for any kind of topic, it's really great for maybe defining terms that you maybe don't understand yet. It's great for summarizing data and asking for suggestions. It's really good for discovering different viewpoints. And I'll talk about a prompt for that in a moment. Summarizing, summarizing idea is really good. So you can essentially give it uh, a, a large amount of data and then it will summarize that inf information for you or you could you could give it um a, a paragraph and then it will ask it for additional suggestions or ask it for improvements so researching is, is also really good you can also use it to ask for frameworks so for example if you're writing a sales letter you can ask uh, chat gpt to provide some um frameworks for sales letter writing and see what it comes back with and then you can implement those into the work that you do. So it's really it's really useful for, for research. It's not just for generating text. You can go in and ask lots of questions and get information that you that you need. So I've, I've used it a lot for, for that kind of initial, before I even start writing anything, just to go off and find out more about the topics that I'm writing about. It's really good for summarizing data. So if you have, if you if you've written a large report, or you've written a blog, so something quite long form, you can ask ChatGP to summarize it for you. This is really useful if you're writing a social media post to promote a blog, for example. So what you could do is you could put your blog into ChatGPT and say, please, could you summarize this in however many words? And it will do, it will do a, a summary for you, which you can then drop into a social media post. So that's quite useful. You can also make it really short and put it onto I was going to say Twitter, which is now X, but you know what I mean, or threads. So you can you can also use it to to summarize. If you've got a big report, you could use it to summarize that to send to people in your business, tell them more about it, or to, again to use it as a a way to promote or, or drive people to 
your report. So it's really good for summarizing information. It's actually, yeah, it's actually really good at that. Um, it's good for by beating writer's block. So I've been working with a, I do copywriting mentoring as well. And I've been working with a, a copywriter who's really struggled actually lately with writer's block, which has been interesting. And we have been, I've shown him a range of tools that we can use about AI. It's a great starting point. So if you're, if you're one of those people that look at a blank screen and go, oh my gosh, like, where am I going to start? AI is brilliant for that because you could essentially ask it to write your introduction and then you've kind of got over that blank page. And if you go, you can always go back and change it later or go into it and, and edit it. But it's just really nice for getting something started. It's also really good for structures. So if you're doing a blog, you might want to ask it to help you with a blog structure. And again, it means that you don't have to start from that, that blank page. Um, it's also good for making your writing better. So you could also th think of ChatGPT almost like a writing mentor or a writing coach. You can ask it to look at your work and make some suggestions around grammar or spelling or tone. You can ask it to make your writing more persuasive or more conversational. So use it to, when you've written something, even if you've written it 100% human, you can put it in and, and, and get some suggestions on your work. So again, it's not just a text generation tool. You can use it for all of this other, uh, all these other ways as well. And obviously it's great for first drafts and springboards. So this is where I use it. I still think that we need human writers. I, I haven't generated anything on ChatGPT that I get that I would say that is really beautifully copywritten. So uh, for me, it's around it's around using it for these things. So you know, summarizing and researching and making my writing better and getting a first draft. So with a lot of write, you can use this pretty much anything, but you can get a first draft down pretty quickly. If you give it a very detailed prompt, you should probably get something relatively specific back. And then you can go in and add your own human element, your own amazing voice your brand voice whatever it might be you can you can then go in and add that to the ai generated content i think it's really important that we don't completely outsource our writing we don't outsource you know you don't outsource you your your voice to these tools that we use them as a as a basis and then add that that element of us or our brand back into it not just because the writing will be better like that but also because for example, search tools now. So Google, for example, they have, they're not penalizing AI generated content, but they have said, we don't really mind how it's created, the content's created, but, but it has to be of high quality. So the same as it's always been. And so actually, if we're just generating copy and copying and pasting it and putting it into our sites or into our content, it's not necessarily going to perform very highly in the search engines. So adding your voice and adding your human writing skills on top is, is pretty important. So what can't it do? Um, it, it can actually do a whole, it can do so much. Um, I think, as I've just said, I, I think it, it can't really match, uh, you know, great writing or really human, energetic, beautiful writing. It can't do that yet. And it, it also struggles concept with conceptual work. So, for example, I use, as I said, I've since January, I've used it on all of my uh, copywriting work just on a separate screen I've only just started using AI on live jobs and I've uh, spoken to my clients before doing that so that we've got this open have this open conversation around whether they're happy for me to use AI or not but one thing I found in doing that research was that when it came to things like uh, campaign lines or conceptual like ad sets or really like quirky interesting lines that really stand out it, it really struggled with that. And I say that it's good for first drafts, but when it came to, so I had to do some advertising lines for a food, food uh, a drink brand. And uh, it, I just couldn't even use it as a base. So the output from that point of view, it was very cliched. It was very, um, a bit cringy. Um, and I think when you think about it, you know, these tools are trained on the internet. So what you essentially get is a quite a, it's almost like an average that you get. So yes, it's really effective, but you, if you want anything that's very lateral thinking, very off the wall, you will, you, you're going to have to start from scratch, I'm afraid. Sorry. <laughs> so um, it's all about the prompting and this is what everyone is saying. Of course they are. Um, it, it matters what you put in. So as you can, as you, you know, the idea is rubbish in, rubbish out. If you put in a, a vague and very short prompt, you're going to get out of a very generic answer and probably not anything that you really 
want to come out it, I mean it'll be fine it just won't really match exactly what it is that you want to create so prompting is really important and that's the same with mid journey when I go on to that in a moment um it's a massive topic and there's just so many different uh, different prompts in my workshops I obviously talk more about this in detail today I'm just going to do four prompts that you might find useful that you can take away and use today um so the first thing is narrow it down and this is this is like probably the key thing if you're using chat gpt to really be specific about what it is that you want so if you wrote i've crossed it out but please provide me with an outline for a blog on mental health in the workplace if you ask that you'll get something back but it won't be very specific so if and this is a this is just a rough example of what I said, but please provide me with a persuasive and compelling outline for a blog on mental health in the workplace aimed at ambitious small businesses. So you, so it's good to say what kind of blog you want, who you're aiming it at, what tone you'd like it to be. So I've said make it authoritative and emotionally engaging. I also wanted to highlight the key challenges for the reader, as well as the solutions to those challenges. So being really specific, and that's a bit probably that's that's quite a, like an over exaggerated um prompt but but actually that kind of information is 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 your what you get from that will be much better from that from that open that that more generic line so really be specific about what is it that you want who are you aiming at who, who are you aiming it at if it's a blog outline you might also say i actually can you include these three points so do a little bit of research before you go in and then and then put that in so when i've done a blog outline I would be specific about who it's for, what I want to do, what the subject is. And then I would oft, often give it five bullet points and say that this is what these are some of the things that I'd like to cover. So really narrow it down, be specific. Um, finding different viewpoints is, a, is an interesting one. And I've talked a little bit about research. So if you're writing a blog on a topic, one thing that's quite useful is to list all the possible viewpoints on, the, on this topic. So you could say, I'm writing a blog on topic, please could you list all the possible viewpoints on this topic and please reply in bullet points. So this is quite useful if you're if you're writing a blog on something and you would like to get some different perspectives or you're trying to find an angle for a blog or an angle for an article. It's quite a nice way to do that, to just list, have a whole list of the viewpoints on that topic. And actually, sometimes you'll find viewpoints that you didn't even hadn't even thought about. Um, and you can also see there that I've been quite specific about how I want ChatGPT to reply to me. So I said, please reply in bullet points. It might be that you wanted to reply in um, a short summary paragraph. It might be that you wanted to reply in headlines. Whatever you want to do, again, just be very specific about how you'd like it to reply. So bullet points are really useful if you're doing things like research or frameworks or outlines. Um, I also say please and thanks. So you'll notice that in all my prompts. Um, what else have we got? Hang on a second. Mm, here we go. So another thing you can do to make ChatGPT more specific is to provide examples. Um, so for example, if you're writing headlines, you could provide a list of your best performing headlines as inspiration. So please could you write me 10 compelling headlines for an article on X, please use the following article headlines as inspiration. And that's quite useful. And actually that's useful for pretty much any kind of work you're doing. So if, for example, you're writing case studies, if you put a couple of case studies in that you've already written and say, please use these case studies as a guide on style and tone, it will then bring something that's much closer to where, where you've been in the past. I mean, it won't be um, um, like, although it's completely copywritten, but it will give you, take you much closer than if you didn't give it any kind of uh, prompt or example. So that's quite useful to think about. I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that you probably shouldn't put into chat GPT in a moment. Um, you could also ask it for improvement. So I spoke earlier about using it as a writing coach or a mentor. So I've written this article, please, can you give me five ways to improve it? And again, it's just really interesting. Even if you are a great writer, it's, it's useful sometimes just to get a different viewpoint. And it's been trained on all the writing on the internet. So it's it's pretty useful for, for things like that. And you might find actually that something comes back and you go, well, actually, that's pretty interesting. I think I will include that. So those are just four tips. There's lots and lots of others. But um, I'm conscious that we don't have a huge amount of time, so we'll we'll move on to the next bit. So considerations and ethics. Um, again, four things that probably you should think about before as use as you're using ChatGPT. Think about the data that you're adding in. So I've just said that it's going to be better if you put information in, but please be careful what you put in. 
don't put in anything proprietary or confidential or personal into models like ChatGPT, because what happens is these models are constantly learning and they will take the information that you put in and use it to train. So there's been an issue with Samsung lately that you may well have seen where they um, ended up, where confidential information ended up coming out in the, in some, you know, someone else's output somewhere else. So just bear that in mind. You don't want to be putting information into chat GPT. It's a massive model. It's been used by millions of people. Um, transparency is really important. I think if you're a freelance writer, it's wise to have conversations with your clients so for example I before I use AI on any of my copywriting live jobs I've spoken to my clients and said how you know how do you feel about this some have been very happy some have said I don't really want to use it that's fine but having those conversations is important that I have read articles lately and there's one freelance writer who's using AI who um who's client ran her work through an AI copy detection tool, found out it was AI written, and then fired her. So this is why it's really important, I think, to be to be very open and uh, with your clients. For me, this is really important because I really value the trust that I have with my clients as well, because I think there's, there will be a growing distrust between writers and clients going forward, especially with AI text. Um, you can detect, you know, detect whether these uh, we're using AI generated content or not. Um, so that actually just having those conversations just saves any kind of embarrassment later on when they go, well, we've run your stuff through a detection tool and it seems like you've been using AI. It's probably just a, you know, just good to say, I'm going to use it for this and this and this. How do you feel about that? So transparency is, is, is important. And um, fact check everything. So if you're going to use ChatGPT, just bear in mind that it often makes stuff up. So in the world of AI, it's called AI hallucinations, which essentially makes it, it's just made it up. Um, and the interesting thing is it's well-written, made up stuff. So uh, chat GPT, read it. It sounds very authoritative. It sounds very, um, it's, it's well-written. And so we kind of believe it. So just double check everything, especially if you are using it for research, um, just double check that everything has come back. It makes sense and actually exists in the real world. Uh, again, just to, this is also you know pretty important for your reputation as a business, uh, as a freelancer, whatever it might be. And then I said earlier, but don't like don't outsource you. You are an amazing human being. You you can write. You can do incredible uh, creative things with your brain. So don't outsource you. Yes, these tools are amazing. So use them to as a basis. Use it to to explore and research and use it as a first draft. But we want to be the thinkers and not the assistants. So these things are, are positioned to us as AI assistants, but we don't want to get to the point where essentially we're the assistant and just piecing together bits of um, AI generated content. That's my view anyway. But yeah, do you preserve that element of you? Do you add your human touch, your personality, your quirky phrases, whatever it might be into your writing? It will make it much better and, and probably will support in terms of search engines, you're gonna get a better response. It's gonna be more valuable content if you add in your stuff on top of it. So imagery, I'm trying to think where we are now. Um, so I haven't got a huge amount of time. So AI generated imagery for business. So there are some amazing, amazing tools for generating images for your, for your business. There's, these are three main ones. So there's Dali, which is an open AI tool, which is the same as ChatGPT, uh, overarching business. There's Stable Diffusion, and then there's MidJourney. For me, I have really, I love MidJourney. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And that's the one that I've really focused in on. So in the same way, as I was talking about Jasper, I think finding a tool that works with you and then almost growing with that and learning with that because you can get so lost in trying all of them but actually if there's one that works for you and your business you're probably better off sticking with that and and learning about the updates as they, as they go and that's what I've I've done with my journey so essentially with, with this is the I've used the same prompt here on all three models and this is the things that you get back so the Dali one's a bit disappointing and this is about robots around a campfire it's a bit disappointing, but Dali's really good at doing sort of real life stuff. Mid Journey's got this like beautiful aesthetic and it's also getting really good at, at um, photorealistic imagery as well. So in terms of what it can what it can do, it can do anything anywhere that you need images. Uh, it, it kind of it does the job. So it's really good for doing unique and unusual images, because obviously with these tools, 
so just like chat gpt you prompt these tools to generate something that you want or something that's in your imagination and you need to be specific about what it is you want but you on mid journey you do um imagine and then you type in what you what you'd like to see so they're really good for creating things for blogs and social media because what you're going to get is something that's unique because you can be really specific about what it is that you want to see you don't have to go onto things like unsplashed or um, pexels and find something that's kind of not quite really what you want but it will do, that it, it will do so you can be very very specific you can also make things that are a bit unusual or a bit um sorry i'm just gonna um, a bit more conceptual so these are two images so you can do something that's very photorealistic so a guy at his, his desk or you can do something that's much more eye-catching and creative so a, a lady with their sort of mind and creativity and flowers and whatever you want to do um but you can see what you can how you can um generate something very very specific but if it's on social media if you've got an image like the one on the right there that's 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 something that stands out compared to most of the stuff that you see on social media so you can really use it to um to give your brand a little bit more of a kind of uh, look or a, or a style we can also use it for mock-ups and, and not just mock-ups as in uh, so in the world of advertising i always think of mock-ups as being something that you um create to give people a rough idea of what it is you're doing and it's really good for that so if you're doing leaflets or brochures or present it's actually works for presentations you can put in images from mid journey or one of these tools you can also use it to do mock-ups as in um let me show you as in a physical product so if you've got a, 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 a service or a business that makes actual physical products you can make things like this which you can then obviously take into photoshop or into canva so it might be a you know a tote bag with your logo on it or it might be a jumper i've also put made some bush shelters here in london which i could then put you know an advert on or whatever i wanted to put on and any this could be anywhere you could put a, a billboard on the moon if you wanted i mean wh whatever you can think of whatever background or want whatever you can you can make it happen so you can also make things look pretty interesting we can also use it for Profile pictures and portraits. So if you, this isn't mid journey, but you can, there's a range of tools you can use. There's Runway and there's also another one called um, Avatar AI. So if you want to do headshots that are a bit more interesting. So the one of me there is as an astronaut, you train it on your, a range of selfies and it will generate a range of uh, Im crazy images. These are ones of me. I feel like they kind of look like me, but they're not really like me. And the one in the middle, I just look so haggard. But that those are these these are the kind of things you can you can do with AI. It's also really good for so mid journey back to mid journey. It's also really good for illustration. So if you want to use illustration styles in your content or on on the web or wherever you want to use it, and you can do so many different types of illustrations. So there's three here that I've done. So there's one that's kind of line drawingy style. There's one that's just flat illustration style like Memphis style. Then you can do three D styles as well. So it's really great for because it's not we can't always afford to use illustrators so you might want to have a, have a play with this and then potentially if you do get a style that you really love you could then go and get an illustrator to do it professionally for you but if you want to try things out or explore concepts it's really good for that and you know they look pretty impressive um they're also really good for brainstorming or ideas for starting points again so if you're a designer or if you want to give a designer something a, a better brief you can use mid journey to help you to do that so here's some poster rough ideas of poster designs for an ai event that um that i was doing so i used mid journey to get me started and then passed it on to a designer and said oh i kind of like this this style and this this feel you can do mood boards whole load of stuff um just on the you can see on the posters there it does it, you can't generate text so um it will generate nonsense text um so that's just something to, to bear in mind but i mean the, the rest of it is is pretty beautiful so you can yeah use it as a, a jump off point and the same as i said with chat gpt you know this can be a starting point for you to use your amazing design skills your or, or to take it through to a designer to say I've, I've got this kind of rough idea and i really like could you add you know your human touch to it and make it really amazing for me um so you can do things like logo designs these are just some really rough logo design ideas that I played with and some also app little app graphics um quite useful for that too so those are quite useful um so notes on prompting so mid-journey prompting is a bit is is 
there's so much again to it and you could do a whole session on on this but it, it in the same way as ChatGPT, it all comes down to the text prompt you've got to be really specific about what it is you want interestingly if you if you give it a very short prompt mid-journey you're relying on the models like default aesthetic to fill in the gaps so if you do want to use mid-journey to fill in the gaps then you do a very short prompt but you you really want to be very specific about about what it is you want Midjourney also have other more, sort of slightly more advanced prompts. So you can do things like image prompting. So you can put an image in and then we'll use that as a guide to generate whatever it, gen whatever it generates for you. So it won't necessarily completely replicate it, but it will it's sort of give a nod to it. And that's quite interesting to see the outputs on that. And there's also parameters. So alongside your text prompt, you can also use parameters which will change the way that the image is generated so you can get you can change the size of your image you can also add in things like chaos and weird i mean there's so many things you can do with the parameters to influence the out output so let me just have it so if you're structuring basic prompts i'm not going to go through all of these but this these are the kind of things that you might want to put into your prompt to make it really specific so the subject is the most important thing you know what is it that you want to see on your image and bear in mind that what you put at the front of the prompt has a stronger weight than what you put at the end of it. So start with your subject, start with what you want to see. And then you can add all sorts of things. You know, what kind of medium do you want it to be in? Is it an illustration or a is it photorealistic? Is it a doodle or an etching? Do you want it to have a particular style? Maybe it's paper art or steampunk or pointillism. You can think about lighting. Lighting is really important. So using things like um, studio lights or... Um, like things like golden hour are pretty good or dawn or dusk you get quite a nice light with that you can add colors and moods composition if you're a photographer i've seen some really amazing images that are generated with photography prompts so if you know your stuff on you can be very specific about what camera you want it to be uh, to use what film you want it to be done on um the shutter speed and the aperture you can put all of that in to get out an output that is really very specific and really what you're looking for um Keep it concise. So mid-journey, this is mid-journey's uh, actual guidelines. So although it's really tempting to put in everything that I've just said, be again, it's about being specific. So you don't necessarily need to put all of this in, but just think, just in your mind's eye, have what it is that you want to create and then, and then do that in, in as concise a way as you can. So I've got an example there, but um, I'll put how would it show. Show me a picture of lots of red poppies, blah, 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 blah. blah. If you, if you make it a bit shorter, you'll get, um, it will be less confusing and you'll get a better output. Mid Journey, I've also got a prompt now, which is called Shorten. And if you put in a long prompt and ask it to shorten it, it will then tell you how to shorten it to get the best results. So the tools are helping us to get a better, better results as well, which I think is really uh, useful and interesting because if you put in your prompts and then you learn what Mid Journey is suggesting that you use, you also learn about prompt writing at the same time. You kind of know, okay, so next time I'm just going to do this, this, and this. So that's pretty helpful. Um, just one parameter. So there's loads of parameters. But my favorite parameter that I really wanted to show you uh, is the weird parameter. So um, this is something you add at the end of your prompt. And I did a, I, just to show you, this is quite random, but I did dog as an orange. And you can see here that there's a dog with a kind of orange peely skin, and there's a dog with an orange. If you put the weird uh, parameter in, I've also got other parameters, but ignore those. Uh, weird 500, you then get something that's much more offbeat. And I love this about um, Mid Journey because it's actually really hard to get offbeat stuff from AI because it's trained on, as I said, the whole internet. And um, you often get something that's quite generic. So um, the weird, uh, parameter is great for getting something really like would just take you I mean I just wouldn't have thought about a, a dog with a an orange mask so if you're a designer or you want to come up with some wacky ideas the weird parameters is, is, is really great for that uh what else have we got so considerations and ethics a few things that I do with mid journey and this is my again my sort of personal viewpoint on this I really value human creativity and I still want there to be human artists I love human creativity I love art I go to art galleries and I'm one of those really geeky people that like get really close to the art so I can see the brush strokes so that I can kind of connect with the right with the artist so for me I um 
because I want that to continue and I want artists to be paid for their work, these are the kind of things that I consider when I do mid-journey. So for example, I don't use a, a specific artist in my prompts. I use an artistic style. So I would say flat illustration or cubism or line drawing. Um, there's also a concept in, um, in writing, in satirical writing called punching up versus punching down. So in satirical writing, the idea is that you punch up and you take the mick out of someone who's higher in society. So think about things like spitting image where you would you know, take the mick out of royalty or high profile people rather than taking the mick out of people at the other end of the spectrum. And it's the same here, you know, if you're gonna use an artist, maybe give someone who's massive, who's got a massive estate. So maybe go for Picasso rather than some like really cool young up and coming artist from New York that you've seen on the internet, you know, rather than using that as a prompt. This is probably someone who's really worked their ass off to create a style and a look for themselves. And, and, and I always feel a bit uncomfortable kind of going, oh, well, I want my thing to look like that. So maybe just think about how you're, if you're using a particular artist, how, whether you use them at all and if you do use them are you comfortable using some like cool up and coming artists to uh, to take their style um it's quite useful to publish the prompts and any artists that you've included just again to go down that transparency route is really important that we're transparent about how we're using the tools it helps other people to learn and it also means that, that people will get to know that artist if you have used an artist which might then send people off towards their website or um and then help them to get paid for their work um and also to acknowledge how we got here so the only reason that we can create this amazing work on mid journey and other um tools like this is because that we've essentially scraped the internet to create these models and these artists there's a lot of court cases going through at the moment in terms of chat gpt and in terms of these tools because um essentially these artists work has been scraped and put into the models without any form of consent so you know we have to be aware when we're using these tools the only reason we can do this is because there's been hundreds of amazing, amazing, thousands of amazing artists who've worked their asses off to create beautiful styles and beautiful art. And that is why we're, we're here being able to do what we're doing. And it'll be very interesting to see how um, those court cases turn out going forward and how, you know, where there's a way for us to compensate human, um, human creators for the amazing work that they're doing. So very whistle stop. Uh, I'm sorry, I've gone over. I've not left very long for questions, but uh, Q&A, sorry, there's so much to say. <laughs> no problem. And we've had um, so many questions come through, so I'll just um, get started on those. So first question is, um, so someone said, are there any sources to teach me how to use mid-journey? They're having some, they're facing some difficulties understanding it. So you can you can go on to midjourney.com uh, and there's quite a lot there. If you want an intro to midjourney, just promote my own stuff. I've got a workshop on the 12th of September, which is an hour and a half. It will go through all of the stuff that I've talked about. So the prompts, the parameters, um, use cases, et cetera, et cetera, which is on my website. <laughs> okay. um, and next question is, can you clarify what you mean by using a big artist versus small artist? Do you mean in terms of acknowledging their work? Yeah, I, that's just a personal thing that I do. I just think I feel more comfortable using someone like Picasso, you know, someone who's got a massive mm -hmm. estate, who's earned a lot of money rather than using some, you know, like really young up and coming artist who's, who's trying to get their work off the ground. I just feel like actually to take that style and put it into my mm -hmm. own work feels a bit wrong to me, but you know, that's just my personal viewpoint. Perfect. And another question is, um, so someone said, thank you for the amazing presentation, Kerry. And they've asked, what tool would you recommend to create a LinkedIn profile picture? <laughs> um, so I would I would go to, if you wanted to do those images that I should, they're a bit wacky, um, but I'd go to either Runway ML, where you can train a, um, a model or Avatar AI, but just check with Avatar AI the terms and conditions of that and how they're going to use your data. Perfect. Um, and just looking through the chat as well, we've had um, so much amazing feedback saying thank you very much, appreciated, and um, this presentation has been awesome. Um, so other questions include, so someone's asked, how do all of these AI sites work with copyright? And I think you've kind of touched on it previously and how um, to not 
kind of include any confidential information yeah. if using these AI tools. Yeah. So if you if you're using these, uh, if you're generating images on Midjourney, they're they're yours. Um, the same as same as Chat GPT output is yours. Um, but yeah, just be careful what you put in. And just again, you know, all this is uh, likely to change going forward with the court cases that are going through a- around how artists will be compensated or how they will be compensated if at all. Um, so yeah, the, the things they're yours. What you generate is yours to do what you want with it. It's just nice to credit. I just think it's nice to credit where you've used it, how, where, how it's been created. Yeah. And someone else has asked, can it help with making text easier for people with more limited literacy? So, e.g. Yes. with an age prompt. Yeah, so if you want it to, yeah, if you highlight what you've written, so either you can get it to generate something from scratch, or if you've written something and you're like, oh, this is really long winded, or it's not quite what I wanted to say, um, you can, you can put it into ChatGPT and ask if it it can improve it from a grammatical or, you know, punctuation point of view, it will do that. So it will kind of do a Grammarly, maybe not quite as effective as Grammarly, but it will, it will do that for you, yes. Perfect. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. So someone's asked, is there an app for Midjourney and can you also give an example of a prompt? Uh, yeah. So um, let me just go back to, I've got one somewhere. So uh, there's a, you have to, so I should have said that about Midjourney. So Midjourney, you need to go through a, so if you go onto midjourney.com, it will, it will tell you how to do it, but you have to go through Discord, which is like a WhatsApp if you, if you haven't got Discord. And so what you do is you, it's like a conversation like ChatGPT, but through the messaging app of Discord and you, and you give it a prompt. So you, when you're doing a prompt for Midjourney that you, you type in forward slash imagine. So it's like, you know, imagine. And then it will come up and it'll say prompt and you put in a prompt. So whatever you can imagine. And you can just write in anything that you can think of in your mind. There's no like set way of doing that. If there's something in your mind, just just say, you know, dog as an orange is what, what I, I did. And then then there's other things you can add on the end, like parameters. And you can add, as I said earlier, there's quite a lot of depth and information on that. Um, but yeah, once, once you set up on Discord, it's, it's really straightforward. It's just a little bit of a faff to set up, but it's really worth it. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Kerry. Thank you um, so much to everyone who has joined us on today's webinar. We hope you found it useful. Please do share your feedback using the link in the chat. We'd love to know how we did and how we can improve. Um, Just a reminder, again, that we will be sharing the recording and further resources in a follow-up email this afternoon. But thank you again to Kerry for sharing your wisdom with us today. And I hope everyone has a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much.